There's a David Foster Wallace interview with Charlie Rose from a while back that has the two men chatting about the author's work. This was not long after the release of Infinite Jess, following a previous time the author was on the show for a roundtable with Jonathan Franzen and Mark Liner to discuss the future of American fiction. This was at the height of the war for eyes between literature and television, and had the authors discussing what it meant to be a writer in an age when television was winning the popular vote. Wallace found the appearance not nearly as painful as he was expecting it to be, and agreed to follow up for a one-on-one interview with Charlie Rose not long after. Wallace was never one for doing a lot of publicity. It's not that he isn't very good at it, I'd argue from a lot of the appearances I've been able to find on YouTube, he is very good at it, and he is one of those public-type intellectuals who is able to sound in person like he does on paper. But it's clear he was a man who was always aware of himself when he was in front of an audience. There's a bit in Although of course you end up becoming yourself, a travel log of sorts written by David Lipsky, following the Infinite Jest book tour with Wallace, where he says that his greatest fear is that he becomes one of those celebrity-obsessed writers who spends their whole time trying to get into the back of pictures at parties. It's part of the reason why he always wore that bandana. I'm sure there's a fair amount of affectation in there somewhere. When questioned about it, he always says that it was to stop his brain from exploding. But if we take what we know about the character of David Wallace in The Pale King seriously, then it was also a means of managing his anxiety and the copious amount of sweat it produced. In the clip, you can see David Foster Wallace isn't exactly the sort of interviewee Rose is used to. Charlie Rose is clearly at home in front of the camera, Wallace even comments on it, and is quick to disregard any of the uncomfortableness or self-consciousness Wallace claims to be undergoing. This is what? Well, I'm just going to look pretentious talking about this. No, why it's... Are, quit worrying about how you're going to look and just be. I've got news for you. Coming on a television show stimulates your what am I going to look like gland like no other experience. Particularly when the subject of the author's personal life and experiences with drug addiction come up in conversation. I mean, it was drugs and you were suicidal and, and the whole nine yards, yes? Yeah, here's why I'm embarrassed talking about it. I not because know why. It, Not because it, I'm personally ashamed of it, but because everybody talks about it. I mean, it sounds like... Uh, In other words, it everybody, sounds, it, everybody talks about it for themselves or everybody talks about you? Uh, no, everybody talk. it sounds like some kind of Hollywood thing to do. Oh, he's out of the rehab and no, back in action. No, I didn't say anything about rehab. The rumours of Wallace's drug addiction followed him around a lot after the release of Infinite Jess which probably isn't surprising given the thousand page novel is set in part around a drug rehabilitation centre, and you can't really be surprised that Rose tries to take the conversation in that direction. Wallace was reportedly an alcoholic and developed an addiction to marijuana, but it was a big rumour at the time that he'd also been doing heroin, something the not all that great adaptation of Lipsy's book End of Tour really leans on. These twin addictions, in conjunction with his depression, landed him on suicide watch and a stint in a recovery facility. It's clear then that Infinite Jess was inspired by Wallace's time in recovery, but he's still very private about the details. Don Gately, an ex-break-in and entering specialist and painkiller addict from Infinite Jest, is supposedly based on an amalgamation of several people Wallace met at the AA meetings he attended at church. However, even after Infinite Jess's release, he refers to them only obliquely as friends he met through his church leaning on an implied faith he's keeping secret, as opposed to his AA or NA meetings. Again, a lot of this is just my opinion. A fair amount of armchair psychology mixed with small bits of fact and fiction I picked up from D.T. Max's biography of David Foster Wallace. Every ghost story is a love story, but you can see how uncomfortable Wallace gets whenever he gets tangled up by an assumption or a projection he doesn't want to be tarred with. There's a lot of time taken in Wallace's work, Try and sort out the difference between what he is trying to communicate to you and what he worries you might take from it. Take, for example, the author's Ford notes in The Pale King, where Wallace will take great pains to ensure you are always aware of when he is talking about himself as the author, i.e. David Foster Wallace, and when he is referring to his insert version of himself, simply just David Wallace. It's part of the reason why his sentences are just so long. He spends so much time in the clauses because he wants to make sure that everything he is describing to you is well understood. That what he is saying cannot be confused with something he is not saying. Something that comes up a lot in Wallace's interviews is his perception of Infinite Jess versus how a lot of cricket... crickets? Critics reacted to it. While a lot of positive reviews picked up on its humour, its wordplay, its absurdity, its distinctly comic comedic characters, he always thought of the book as a very sad book. We can define what Wallace means by this, by how he talks about humour in the work of Franz Kafka. In his essay on the difficulty of teaching Franz Kafka to modern students, 
titled Laughing with Kafka, he talks about how the trouble with explaining Kafka's humour is that most people have grown up believing that humour should be entertaining. As he writes, No wonder they cannot appreciate the really central Kafka joke, that the horrific struggle to establish a human self results in a self whose humanity is inseparable from that horrific struggle. The humour, as per his essay on Kafka, is meant to be exceedingly dark. When we read something like The Suffering Channel, the sadness of the character is meant to contrast with the absurdity of the situation around them. It's a cruel joke. A part of it is that your inner world is so different to your outer world. Your perceptions of yourself, or what you perceive as right or wrong, are very different to how everyone else perceives them, in such a way that the latter seems built to make the former feel worse. It's the opposite to an inside joke where you're the only one not in on it. The Suffering Channel is based on the idea that you can tune in to watch someone in pain. There are whole industries then in place to benefit from someone feeling bad. This could be a capitalist system or simply a social one. But when you're depressed, this is how the world feels to you. It's alien, it's strange. Anyone who doesn't feel like you then is completely beyond understanding. They're absurd. And you can see in this interview with Charlie Rose, they were struggling to reconcile the two. But this all changes once Charlie Rose brings up David Lynch. Wallace is always more at ease talking about other people's work than his own. As well as a fiction writer, he had a great career as an essayist to explore other people's works. Whether that be John Updike, Tracy Austin's ghostwriter, or even Quentin Tarantino. But one of his most famous pieces is based on his visit to the set of Lost Highway, while Lynch was still in production. Now Wallace isn't 100% at ease though. There's a funny bit early on where he makes a pointed remark to Rose, asking about the visit where he says, Did you like the movie Lost Highway? I have not seen the movie Lost Highway. I've seen the rough cut of Lost Highway or, or scenes. They let me go in and sit in what I believe to be David Lynch's personal editing chair. But again, it's one of those moments where Wallace really comes alive as someone who's able to be erudite and expansive on subjects other than his own work. I know a lot of people whose only encounter with the writer are a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. Certainly Wallace's most famous piece of non-fiction, where he talks about the lethal modernity of a cruise ship holiday. Or it's this David Lynch article, and if you read it, I think you can see why. It's got all of Wallace's best traits. His wit, his wordplay, his ability to exaggerate people to the point of grotesquity. Grotesquity? Grotesquity? Okay, uh, uh, gr- grotesquity. Grote- make people look grotesque. <laughs> His portrayal of Balthazar Getty, asking about what everyone's saying about him and bumming cigarettes off everyone, still colours my opinion of him even to this day. But it has a greater sense of accessibility, so it doesn't have the massive length of one of his novels. He makes it clear in the story that his presence on set was only allowed on the proviso that he did not wish to speak to Lynch himself. He makes it out in the article that he's being treated on set as an outsider, someone who has just wandered in there by accident and hoped no one would notice like he's a fan who's won a competition rather than the journalist who's been sent there by a magazine. When he writes up his interactions with the cast and crew, more specifically the crew, he does so with a tone like he's one who's barely being tolerated. Wallace isn't an outsider though, and he hasn't wandered on set by accident. Wallace was already an established writer in both fiction and non-fiction, and would go on to make a name for himself as a lowercase j journalist. He would write an essay on John McCain, where he followed the Republican senator during his 2000 election campaign, and he would go on to write popular essays about the AVN Porn Awards, tennis, and the Maine Lobster Festival. These essays have not come without their controversy, but they're at the same time windows into the sort of things David Foster Wallace thinks about. As he says to Charlie Rose, a lot of these essays end up being about me. His time as a junior tennis player, his relationship to television, even when he's sent to describe the experience of a pleasure cruise, he makes it about the tragic suicide of a passenger a few years before. And with David Lynch... Wallace explores the first time he saw Blue Velvet at the cinema and the impact it had on him as an artist and a writer. It is, it's almost classically French, Franco-philistically surreal, Um, and yet it seems absolutely true and absolutely appropriate. And there was this, I know I'm taking a long time to answer your question, there was this way in which I all of a sudden realized that the point of being postmodern or being avant-garde or whatever wasn't to follow in a certain kind of tradition, that all that stuff is BS imposed by critics and camp followers afterwards, that what the really great artists do, and it sounds very trite to say it out loud, well, what the really great artists do is they're entirely themselves. They're entirely themselves, they've got their own vision, their own way of fracturing reality, and that if it's authentic and true, you will feel it in your nerve endings. And this is what Blue Velvet did for me. 
I was in my early 20s when I read Infinite Jest, and it was through David Foster Wallace that I got into David Lynch, so the two are linked in my head. For one thing, I think Wallace is right that Lynch is one of the last mainstream filmmakers who was able to fuse avant-garde and popular movie making together. In Wallace's essay on Lynch, he paints the director not so much as a tragic figure, but as someone who was denied their rightful place in the pantheon of 90s new filmmakers. He talks about watching a rundown of influential filmmakers, one of those listicle type programs you used to get all the time on Channel 4 or something. And it listed the Coens, Sodenberg and Tarantino, but didn't even mention Lynch. He particularly took umbrage to the inclusion of Tarantino in the list, who Wallace paints as a being a filmmaker who has cribbed heavily from Lynch, but has made it palatable and flat in the process. And I think he's got a point. Think about how the two directors treat the mixture of the grotesque and the commonplace. The mixture of stylish dialogue against extreme acts of sudden violence. It's something Wallace encapsulates perfectly with the most prominent comparison between the two. Blue Velvet includes Jeffrey Beaumont finding an ear in the middle of a field, a grotesque MacGuffin that will start his decline into the underside of his picturesque American town. Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs will also include the cutting off of an ear, but it's a celebrated moment, a director basking in the controversy of the act. This is not to say that I don't enjoy Tarantino movies, but it's difficult to ignore how the two treat very similar subject matters. Wallace sums it up best himself. Quentin Tarantino is interested in watching somebody's ear get cut off. David Lynch is interested in the ear. Now, I think, Lynch's position in the culture has been cemented. Whether it's online or not, most discussions we have about the great directors of our time always include Lynch. We adore him, and I think Wallace was on the vanguard of this, or at least was one of the voices who led to the popular acceptance of the man particularly after the failure of Twin Peaks Season 2 and the at-the-time maligned film follow-up, Fire Walk With Me. This was before Mulholland Drive and the crowning of Lynch as Twitter's favourite guy. And that is how David Foster Wallace feels to me. He's one of those writers like Virginia Woolf or Carson McCullers, whose work I read when I was at university, still trying to figure out who I was, and he just hit me like no other. To go back to Franz Kafka, he's one of those writers who seems to have taken an axe to my chest. His writing, his characters, his story... His depiction of anxiety and depression, his themes are being seen as one thing and being known as something else, it all strikes me as incredibly, painfully and impossibly relatable. But it's not just his work that influences me, it's him as a person. David Foster Wallace is so open about himself, so vulnerable, that it makes it almost impossible not to empathise with him, even see yourself in him. I've read Infinite Jest, The Broom of the System and The Pale King, I've read all of his short story collections, his essay collections, I've read Lipsky's books, Max's book. I've even read his book on advanced mathematics. For a writer famous for writing about the addictive natures of entertainment, he's someone who is so easy and so fun to read that you don't want to eat or sleep. He's a writer who opened the door for me to discover other artists. Not just Lynch. One of the reasons I read Jonathan Franzen books is because of his proximity to Wallace. I found Zadie Smith through Wallace, Tom McCarthy and Jeffrey Eugenides, Jennifer Egan, George Saunders, Thomas Pynchon and William Gaddis. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Glass, Donna Tartt, Proust, Bartholomew, Bellows. The list can keep going. I have this pet theory that a lot of people, when they first get into reading adult fiction, will get their hands on one or two writers and will fix their tastes around them. This can have disastrous effects. You could end up picking Anne Rand and become an insufferable objectivist. But more often than not, it means you find yourself stuck in a single mode of reading for a while. It's like when you find a fantasy series you really enjoy and then just keep looking for something that is able to match it. I spent a lot of my time trying to find novels that hit me like Infinite Jest did. A book I could get lost in. A book with characters I found interesting and compelling, even when they were being awful to each other. But there's still, but still, there's no denying the fact that reading David Foster Wallace, for a lot of people, is a major red flag. And if you're one of those people, here's the thing. You might be right. When D.T. Max released his biography of Wallace, Every Ghost Story is a Love Story, Brett Easton Ellis criticised it for being overly flattering of Wallace. Ellis, quite predictably, got a lot of slack about this. In classic Brett Easton Ellis fashion, he did it over Twitter, with nothing in the way of contextualising what he was trying to say. But in his defence, and as he would go on to say later, it wasn't so much that he didn't like David Foster Wallace, it's more that he felt like the biography was whitewashing the author, 
There's a lot to be said for that, I think. It's true, for example, that Max's book doesn't go into the nuance of David Foster Wallace's reputation before his death. Wallace, as well as an essayist, was a fierce literary critic, and unlike his essay on Lynch, they are much more vicious. As Ellis says, Wallace could even be bitchy in his reviews. Take this one about one of Updike's later period novels, Towards the End of Time. Toward the End of Time concerns an incredibly erudite, articulate, successful, narcissistic, and self-obsessed retired guy who's keeping a one-year journal in which he explores the apocalyptic prospect of his own death. It is, of the total 25 Updike books I've read, far and away the worst, a novel so mind-bendingly clunky and self-indulgent that it's hard to believe the author let it be published in this kind of shape. But there is also the matter of David Foster Wallace's relationship with Mary Carr. Okay, I'm going to stop there quickly already, because even by saying that sentence, I'm already doing to Carr what a lot of David Foster Wallace fans do to her. Talk about her only in relation to David Foster Wallace. It's an interview Mary Carr did with Lena Dunham, who had written an intro to a, a reissue of Carr's book, The Liars Club, where she sums this up just right. It's as though my contribution to literature is that I fucked him a couple of times in the early 90s. And here I am, doing the same. I think it's a statement in and of itself that while Carr has written much about her own life in her books, Wallace never really comes into it. But I hope you, the dear viewer, are able to give me a little leeway on this, as I don't think it's possible to speak about the cancellation of Wallace without discussing Carr. Carr was married when she and Wallace met, although she makes it clear in Lit this wasn't a particularly happy marriage. Together they had a son, and her and her husband were going through counselling. But Wallace fell very quickly in love with Carr. He would regularly call her, and even got a tattoo of her name on his arm. He is even reported to have said that the character of Madame Psychosis in Infinite Jess, a woman whose incredible looks were the basis for the eponymous Infinite Jess video, that when played would seduce its viewer to forego eating and sleeping in favour of simply just watching, was based on Mary Carr. Their relationship, in reality, however, seemed like it was very off and on. Carr, too, had gone through recovery. She did say that she and Wallace were together for periods of time, or at least she admits to sleeping with him, but it was interspersed between Carr trying to make things work for her husband. Probably the most famous story to come out of this relationship was that apparently, after Carr broke off with Wallace one time, he went out and bought a gun, with the intention of shooting Carr's husband. The source of this story is somewhat murky, and supposedly involves Wallace using the connection of a former drug dealer he met during rehab, which feels a little bit too on the nose and convenient, but it's also the fact that while Wallace was driving Mary in a car one time, the two argued, and it ended with Wallace apparently pushing Carr out of a moving vehicle. D.T. Max's book covers these instances, but there remains a lot of disagreement about how these stories are framed. There is a preemptive element to a lot of these stories, cushioning them in rumour, or even sympathetically towards Wallace. Max's book, for example, talks about how Wallace had difficulty with the expectations of her mother, and had once got annoyed with Carr because she wanted to use the car, her car to pick up her son from school, while Wallace wanted to use it to drive to the gym. However, when Carr talks about Wallace's relationship to their family, she stresses that Wallace would turn up to her house unannounced, and would get violently angry whenever she showed preference for her son over him. The counter-argument to this is obvious. The book is about Wallace. It's one of the first proper chronicles of his life following his death, and the shadow of Wallace's suicide hangs over the narrative. We had seen all the pieces that may have led to a very complicated man who would one day take his own life. Wallace would go on to have healthier relationships than the one he had with Carr. He would have the tattoo he got covered over, and at the time of his death he was married to visual artist Karen Green. Now as far as I know, she has not mentioned anything untowards between her and Wallace, other than he was a little too used to living as a bachelor when they first met, and had to be effectively house trained before they can move in together. But it remains that, in the years since, there seems to have been a lot of evidence that Wallace was far from great when it came to his treatment of women. Wallace taught creative writing in English at multiple points in his life, and during a period of time when he thought he was sick of teaching, claimed to have slept with a student with the intention of making the college fire him. But it's not just that he's done these things that has cancelled David Foster Wallace. If you can cancel a dead man, that is. I've spoken about Josh Whedon before on this channel, and I think there are a lot of comparisons between him and David Foster Wallace. They're both men who made their name in the 90s, who have gone on to have a huge impact on the culture. It's possible, in the same way to say that something is Lynchian or Kafkaesque, to say that something is Whedonesque or Wallaceonian. Particularly when it comes to writing styles and dialogue, 
Whedon's dialogue, particularly how it is implied to the Avengers, is everywhere you look now, for better or for worse, but mostly worse. I actually think the problem with a lot of these comic book movies that employ whedon as dialogue is that most of these writers aren't as good as Whedon is at using it. But that's a whole separate video essay all of itself. I already look like a big enough dork defending David Foster Wallace's writing. I'm not about to do the same with Whedon. And you can see Wallace's impact in everything from David Baddiel's children's stories to the American office. They're both writers who are talked about when we talk about what postmodernism means in the arts. But also, they're both authors who we attribute to a certain type of white male. Okay, before we jump the gun here, let's establish a few things. One, I am a cis white guy. I come from a working class family, but nowadays I rent a flat in London, and I have the sort of middle class job that primarily revolves around the sending and receiving of emails. And so for the most part, I am a classic David Foster Wallace reader. It's part of why I was, hook, line and sinker, just the type of guy who was going to fall for infinite jest. The sort of guy who spent at least two years after reading it, talking about it with anyone who stood still for too long. The book is full of white guys struggling with depression, with white guys dealing with addiction and abuse and self-destruction. But conversely, I don't think it's a stretch to say David Foster Wallace was only someone who influenced white men. Lots of people from different backgrounds have been influenced by Wallace's work or found meaning in it. But regardless of who you are, I'm sure you felt as I have when you've been in a bookstore and taken a David Foster Wallace book up to the counter. The person behind the till has given you a look like this. So, what can I get you? He has become a shorthand for white male authors. For an author who is perhaps oversubscribed, or his reputation as a great author is overestimated because he's white and male. I was on Twitter the other day, God knows why I was doing that, and again the subject came up that white males tend towards writing long books as a way they say to I'll say, okay, I'm going to sit down and write this enormous book and impose my phallus on the consciousness of the world. And I know I wouldn't have to look far to see Wallace's name brought up as an example of this. But regardless of this point, and I mean there are a lot of great female writers who also write very long books, I don't think it's accurate to say Wallace was not also a very good writer who had a very big impact on a lot of people's lives. I think it's a disservice to only linger on one element of Wallace's work. I think it's one of the great disservices to literature that Wallace died before he finished The Pale King. I'm about to talk a lot about the influence and perceptiveness of Infinite Jess, but I think there's a really good argument out there somewhere that The Pale King was just as much a sign of the times that Infinite Jess turned out to be. I think it encapsulates how we have shrewd our psyches to work very dull and repetitive jobs. I think he writes about depression and boredom in The Pale King with just as sharp an eye as he does in Infinite Jest. I think The Broom of the System is not nearly as bad as Wallace claims it is, and I think Oblivion is one of the best collections of short stories out there. But I think Infinite Jest is the first thing anyone thinks of when they think of David Foster Wallace. And I think if I were to try and convince you that he was a good writer with any of his works, you probably wouldn't believe me. It would be like talking about J.D. Salinger without mentioning The Catcher in the Rye or F. Scott Fitzgerald without mentioning The Great Gatsby. The authors have other books, sure, but nine times out of ten, when you ask someone to name something they've written, it would be these novels that would be your answer. Infinite Jest's story is split somewhat between two central characters. Hal and Condenser, a student at the fictional Enfield Tennis Academy, and Don Gately, a recovering drug addict who works as a staffer at Ennett House, a rehabilitation centre. The stories periodically overlap with the search for a mythical piece of entertainment known only as Infinite Jest, which is said to be so visually addictive that anyone who watches it forgets to eat, sleep or go to the bathroom, eventually dying where they sit. I say somewhat because Infinite Jest as a narrative is fractured in so many different ways and includes so many different characters that it's a bit of a fool's errand to even try and summarise its plot. A lot of this, of course, is why so many people are turned away by Wallace's writing. There are many chapters in Infinite Jest that will include stories and characters that will never be seen or referenced again. These chapters read more like independent short stories, such as the story of Kate Gompler, a depressed person who is trying to set her mind right again after a failed attempt on her own life. Each slice of the book is given way to digressions and asides, most of which come into shape as endnotes that litter the novel. There are just over 500 in total, and which all add additional insights or facts relevant or not to the story at hand. The book is like a box of puzzle pieces that at first glance seem like they have been tipped upside and dropped on the floor just for you to sort out. But as you read through it, you realise the larger shape begins to come into focus. 
The video cartridge known as Infinite Jest, the novel is set in the not too distant future, where home entertainment has evolved to a system where all shows, movie and sports are delivered by custom audio cassettes, is tied directly to the recent suicide of Howe's father James, an enigmatic ex-tennis pro who later in life becomes deeply involved in the creation of esoteric and borderline unwatchable movies. There's an ongoing interplay between René Morath, a Quebecian secret agent who is covertly meeting with Hugh Steeply, his US counterpart, about the Quebec secret force's concern for the possible whereabouts of Infinite Jest, after it has reportedly killed a Canadian attaché. It is Steeply who in turn has started following Howe's brother Oren around, convinced that he might be the key to finding the missing entertainment. The whole thing culminating, as much as the book does culminate, with Don Gately being shot by Quebecian secret forces, and while foregoing drugs at the hospital, is visited by the spirit of James in Condenza. There is so much more going on though. There are many characters in both the Ennett Recovery House and Enfield Academy who have long form story arcs. The America in the book has had a part of it nuked, and there is a wild herd of hamsters running free across the nation. There's a mysterious woman at the centre of the story, Madame Psychosis, who may or may not have been the most beautiful woman alive, or possibly someone deeply disfigured. The whole book dealing with themes of addiction, childhood trauma, and what does it mean to be the person you think you are. The writer is witty, sad, funny, overcomplicated sometimes, and overly simple at other times, but it's also insightful. In a world of Instagram filters and Zoom calls, it perfectly predicted the awkward relationship we were all going to have to video calls. And although the cartridge system depicted isn't exactly how streaming turned out, the idea that we are wasting our lives watching a stream of low quality but easy to watch entertainment that will never stop until we are dead is pretty bang on if you ask me. Infinite Jest is the cliche long book. I'm sure a more foresaw editor could have slimmed it down. But if you put aside its length and think of it as a little world you can dip in and out of, slowly making your way through its story, piecing it together as you go, you will find something deeply moving, funny and entertaining. A lot of people roll their eyes at the end notes, and the additional work involved with constantly switching back to the back pages, but after a while that just becomes the norm. What's more, it all feeds into the idea that you should be conscious of the entertainment you are consuming. Infinite Jest is a book that keeps reminding you it is there, in the same way that how the lost young man at its center is likewise trying to do. But what do we do when we enjoy something, but its author, its creator, its director isn't a good person? I can't remove from my head the times in my life when I read Infinite Jest and it made me feel better about myself. But that doesn't count throughout the pain David Foster Wallace called Mary Carr or any other person it most likely negatively affected while he was alive. The usual answer trotted out for this paradox is death of the author. But I don't think that's really any use. Let's talk about AI art for a very quick second. As far as I'm concerned, if I read a book that I really enjoyed, but I later found out that it was written by an AI, the book would mean nothing to me. It would be not much more than a fluke. Nothing much more than if I found out Hamlet had been written by an infinite amount of monkeys. Any insight it had generated would feel inconsequential, and any entertainment or humour present in the book would feel accidental. Art is a complicated form of expression, the nuances of which are the core reason we pick up a piece of art in the first place. The story is an expression of a person's experience or perspective. It is a means for a singular individual or multiple people to process how the world around us feels or function in a way that might enlighten us. Even if the prose or the imagery is pedestrian, we admire a well-structured story but we can conclude that a person has worked hard fitting it together. An action movie might have a paper-thin story, but you watch it for the well-choreographed action scenes or the stunt work involved. We can study these artworks in a historical setting because we can presume that the person who wrote it has been affected by the times and society in which they wrote it, even unconsciously. We might view it as a means for representation, or how it might be in discussion with other pieces of art, likewise developed by a certain person at a certain time. Even mistakes, poor choices or badly made pieces of art speak to the humanity of its creator. These can be just as fun or interesting to consume because we can see the outline of the person on the other side of it. An algorithm that does nothing but pull derivative versions of previously written works into something that is a reaction to a few key phrases 
is not much more than a cliché generator. It is not communicating something important, and is unable to truly generate new ideas. There's a reason why when a story really gets to us, we want to know more about the person who created it. It's why I know the life story of Elaine May, or why I can name all of Orson Welles' wives. Because when something works, when a piece of art hits, we want to understand how or why this person saw what they saw. How they expressed what they expressed. There are times when death of the author is useful. If we find meaning in a piece of work that the author has expressly said was not there on purpose, that reading remains valid regardless. But otherwise, I think it is a meaningless term. Or at least, a term there just to try and make us feel better about consuming art that has been produced by someone harmful. It's something we might trot out to watch Annie Hall again, or to reread all of the Harry Potter books. But then, David Foster Wallace is dead. If he was still alive, would I pick up his new book? I might take pause. I guess I wouldn't know. I guess it's the thing of trying to cancel a dead man. I don't have to make that decision. And then is the fact that he killed himself, that he suffered from a chronic and incredible depression. How do we factor that in? He was clearly a man who was suffering, but that doesn't excuse his impact on other people. So where does that leave me? Or anyone else who wants to read David Foster Wallace? Or anyone that was not a great person, but which created something important to us? The answer, I think, is to just buck it up. It's a consequence of life that we have to live with contradictions. Or at least the consequences of our actions. I eat meat when I know it's not good for me or the planet. I drink too much when I know I shouldn't. That look the person gives you in a bookshop when you're buying a copy of Infinite Jest is deserved. You deserve that look. Hell, I'm British, and I have to live with that crime every day of my life, and I deserve every punishment coming my way because of it. Maybe you just have to accept that maybe you've enjoyed something made by someone who isn't a great person. Does this make you not a great person for doing so? Maybe a percentage less, but then, no one is perfect.